Okay, fine. All right. Uh, very quickly, project two is released. I sent an email out on the mailing list, and you should have all received it. Um, so all the details are on there. We're not going to go over it now. That will be for recitation sections. So go to your recitation sections. Go to any recitation sections so you guys can talk about uh, the project two. Uh, any other regular expression-based questions for right now? Have we got regular expressions locked and loaded? Yeah. Yeah, so regarding the homework, problem one, question, uh, the dead block has like a plus sign in it. So how do we do the plus sign? That's like Is there a plus sign in regular expressions or in the alphabet? No. Okay, then. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I can, I can see it kind of. The good way for showing your work in that one is showing the sequence of steps, breaking it down, applying the rules we talked about here. So, for instance, we talked about what we got here. Right. So, like in this example here, this would be exactly. Wait, that's not an example. Oh, yeah, there we go. Right. So we have. So like we were saying, what's the language uh, described by the regular expression parenthesis A or B parenthesis period C? Then we could break it down like this. We maybe also want to do one step, step to do the language defined by A union with the language defined by B, and then another step where we replace that. So you just want to follow all the rules so that we know you're applying the rules in the right places. So basically just substitute in the values yes. and show that they would work. Yep. That is exactly why we went and defined all these. Yeah? Do you want our answers overlaying the homework or separately? Does it matter? I'm not sure what that means. Like, you gave us a doc. Oh, yeah, if you want to put it in the doc, that's fine. If you want to, it has to be a PDF, though. I'm not going to accept anything else. So. But would it be fine if the answers are just in its own document, just separate? Yes. Like, just yeah. it? Okay. That'd be fine, too. All right, let's continue. So we got down, we started writing tokens. Right, that's where we left off last week as we started to try to define tokens. Uh, we talked about defining a decimal number, and we also talked about why we need to use a slash here, because we have, we want to match a regular expression that matches the dot character, the dot that's in the alphabet, not the dot that is the concatenation operator in our regular expressions. Um, so we did all that, we talked through these examples, we kind of got to somewhere where we got almost close-ish to what we wanted, but we still have this problem of double zeros and multiple zeros. Um, but we're not really going to go into this any further, I just wanted to kind of show you and give you an idea of that it can be a little tricky to write a regular expression that exactly matches what you want and doesn't match anything that you don't want. Cool. All right. So we built up regular expressions. We talked a little bit and tried to develop some intuition about how we could write regular expressions to define tokens. So what is the overall goal of lexical analysis? Why are we doing all this? What was that? To extract tokens. From what? From string. Sequence of characters. Yeah, sequence of characters. Right, yeah. The string is a sequence of characters. I like to I actually like to think of it a little bit lower, like a sequence of bytes. Right? Because that to me really signifies like, okay, these are exactly like that's what a file is, right? A file on your computer is just a sequence of bytes. So we have incoming into our program, a sequence of bytes, and lexical analysis takes those and abstracts them into tokens. Right? And that's our goal is. So in project two, you're going to be, in the second half of project two, you're going to be given a lexer. Right? So a lexer does lexical analysis. It turns a sequence of bytes into a sequence of tokens. And so we're going to talk about lexers as if they have an API of a method called get token. So what's an API? Application program interface. It's a set of uh, pre-written uh, functions that you are allowed to draw from. Yeah. If you, so we're going to say like we have this lexer, 
or we're going to learn how Alexa works. In project two, part two, you're going to be using Alexa we're giving you, and it has a function called get token, which will read from the input string and return the next token in the input string. And we've been talking about regular expressions because we want to define tokens with regular expressions, so we know precisely what they mean and what they don't mean. Right? So going back to that initial image, right? This is the part we're focusing on, right? So we've built up our knowledge of regular expressions. Now we're going to apply those to extract tokens from bytes. So the question is, what does get token actually do, right? And so ideally, you have every time you call get token, it would return whatever the next token is from the input string. So here it'd be like num id num operator id decimal left brace right brace whatever. And so it's reading through the input stream, the bytes, and it's telling you which ones they are. Yeah. So did, this might be dumb, but did you tell us what a token is? Like, what is the essence of a token? What is it? Because it seems like we're classifying different things in this stream that we're reading in. So which, what's a token and what's not a token? Uh, in that? Kind of a philosophical. A token is whatever you, the person defining tokens, define them as. With with regex. So yes. Are we going to be reading in this byte stream and we encounter something and we run it against several different regexes or just one? Yes. So that's exactly what we're going to get into. Yeah. So hopefully that'll make it clear. But the question is really good about what is a token. It's really just an abstract concept, right? A token could have a one-to-one -one mapping with a character, like left angle brace, right, or left parenthesis, right. Those are tokens in the language probably, and they're tokens in uh, their actual characters, right? It could be a one to many, well, one to more than one, like if the character's if map to a token, if token. Or in this case, num, we don't know, there's no limit on how many characters num can match. We just know what num has to look like, right? It can't start with zero, but it can be any number of digits that don't start with zero. Right? And so now the question is, okay, how do we define these? And once these are defined, how do we actually use these to kind of put these things together? Okay. So in our lexical analysis, essentially what we're going to do is define a series of tokens. These are going to be the tokens that are important in our language, right? So it does all tie together, right? We can't, I mean, I guess you could think of tokens as just completely arbitrary from a language, but the purpose is to define the language. And so if we have, let's say, a language that has an ID token of letter concatenated with letter digit underscore star, right? This is what we actually all derive. Or mostly, I think we have an underscore. Could start a letter, but let's stick with this for now. The dot op, the dot character. So what does this regular expression match? Just the dot. Just the dot character, exactly. We know because of the slash. With number, we said, is a P digit concatenated with any number of digits or just zero, right? So decimal is number followed by a dot, followed by a digit, followed by any number of digits. So we'll just use this for now. So is letter, P digit, digit, are they tokens? Why not? Right, so letter is a regular expression. Digit is a regular expression, right? And this ID is also a regular expression, right? But I'm saying here, these are the tokens that I care about, right? Letter, digit, P digit, those are just little helper definitions for me to define what I want, right? When I'm talking about an ID, I want a letter. So instead of saying I want A or B or C or D, right? Write that all out here and here. I can define it in one place and then use that. And so we'll use, most of the time, I'm pretty sure almost all the time, we'll use the convention that all uppercase letters here is denoting that this is a token. <coughs> but do these tokens only refer to regular expressions or these helpers? Where's 
underscore character? Here? What do you mean? What do you mean where? Like what? Because it's not in letter and it's not in digit. Oh, it's literally right here. So this is an underscore character. Oh. In this regular expression right here. I, I understand that. But what does it mean? It means the underscore character. <laughs> so I actually didn't define the alphabet, but the alphabet here would be uh, A through Z, uppercase, lowercase, all the digits, plus underscore, plus a dot character. OK, because you don't have it in the digit. Uh, Digit. Right, because underscore is not a digit, it's not part of digit, right? Digit just okay. defines what is a digit. So oh. then wouldn't you have to define underscore as one of the like doesn't it have to be in one of the alphabets though? No, it's it's not not it's not no, no, no. So okay, so these uh, so the letter digit P digit, those are just helper regular expression definitions. Okay. Uh, we didn't get them here, but we're using the same definitions we already had. Right, I know, but I'm looking at the I'm looking at the slide from last time. Like this. So these are those definitions here. Right, I understand that, but I guess my question is, if there's an underscore character, mm -hmm. right, where did it come from? Because we never you you have letters and digits up there, but you never said, oh, there's also this other thing, an underscore character. Right. So the the main problem is I never defined sigma. Okay. Right. So. Uh, you know, I guess, so informally, right, so I never define what the alphabet is. It's basically A through Z, capital A through capital Z, 0 through 9, underscore, and dot. Okay. Right, and so I guess from, from here on out, we'll just kind of informally. Okay, that's, that's, that was, Yeah, okay. so that's basically where it comes from. So I skip that step. It kind of, when you're doing these, you kind of just, if a character appears here, it's in the alphabet. That's okay. Goes. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> We're getting a little bit further away from like the precise mathematical definition. Of things. Okay. Cool. Okay. Good question. Okay. So we have these regular expressions, right? So decimals composed of what? Number followed by a dot, followed by a digit, followed by a digit star. Right. So we already said digit by itself is not a token. We're not interested in a single digit. But num is a token, right? <coughs> so I have a case where a token is composed of another token. Right? Do you, need, do you technically need the digit in between the digit dot and digit star? Or could you just do dot digit star? Uh, if you do digit star, you'll get empty like one dot. Something. Oh, okay. So this way, you have to at least do 1.0, but now it opens up the possibility of 1.0000. Which we can say maybe we want that for terms of accuracy. Um, okay. Good. Okay, where was I going here? Okay, numbers, right. So the question is could, okay, let's think about this. Given what I already have, could I write like a regular expression like this? Could I write this as a regular expression? Is that one? It says ID. Oh, sorry, I guess it is ID concatenated with num or digit. No. Why? Yeah, so this is a recursive regular expression definition, right? I'm referring to itself here. And regular expressions must be finite. I guess I don't know if we discussed that or not. But the regular expression itself must be a finite string. This is never going to be a finite string. So this means that what we're using here, like when we say num is equal to, we're doing here, p digit, p digit concatenated with digit star. Or zero, right? When we do this, when we say num is this, and then we use num here in decimal, right? We're not we're not 
causing any recursive definition. We're just literally using equality. You could replace every instance of num with the thing on the right. Just like you could replace every instance of digit with 0 or 1 or 2 or 3 or 4. So you get a finite regular expression when you do all those substitutions. Right? It'll just be 1. So it's a helpful shorthand for us. And But the important point is you can't have any recursive regular expressions. Cool. Questions there? All right. OK. So get token as an API. Takes in nothing. You can think that it's reading from the input string. Right? We want it to return a token. So what does it return on this string? 1.1 1 .1 ABC 1.2. One Token returned here. 
1 1.1 as a decimal. 1.1 as a decimal, right? And so when we do that, get token, you can think of that input string has been consumed, right? It's saying, okay, I know 1.1 is a token, and that token is num, so it's going to return num, but the next time you call get token, it's going to now read from abc12, as if you called it on the string abc12, right? Because it's trying to put all these input strings back into num, or turn this input string into a sequence of tokens. And so when it tells you that something is a number, bam, it's made its decision. It's done with that input that it read that mapped to a number. Now it's going to start reading the next input thing. And so when it starts reading from here, what's it going to be? What was that? Is it going to be ABC and ID? Why ABC1? Right. Just like we saw with the 1, 2, 3, 4, right? Yes, ABC is in the language described by the regular expression ID, right? But so is ABC1. Is ABC1 period? No. So we go back and we say ABC1 is an ID. And so now if we call get token, what would the next one be? Dot. Dot. And then? No. No. Right? Just on your first lexin. Yay. Right? And it seems kind of weird because if you looked at this and I asked you what tokens are here, you may say, oh, a number, an ID, or sorry, a decimal, an ID, and then a decimal. <coughs> right? But that's because you can look at the end and say, oh man, if I just took that one from that ID, then I can make a decimal instead of a dot number. Right? But Lexing does not do any, there's no backtracking or anything. It's very much a greedy algorithm of, I figure out which regular expression matches the longest, and I say, bang, that's the first, or sorry, which, yeah, which of these tokens matches the longest, and then I say, bang, this is the token. And then I read all that, and I say, I never, I'm never going to go back and revisit what I did before. That's always going to be, this is always going to be a decimal, and this whole thing is always going to be an ID. Cool. Okay. So this is called the longest prefix matching rule. Wait, longest matching prefix rule. I guess I should probably read it if I'm going to say the exact name of the thing and mess it up. So the idea is we want to find the lexer every time get token is called. The lexer wants to find what's the longest token that matches the current point in the input string. And it's going to say that's your next token. And so what happens if we get into a situation where we have number, that's not number, we have num just like we always have, and then I have another token, let's call it, I don't know, I num or something like that, which is uh, digit dot digit star, so this is p digit. So now let's say I have the string 1, 2, 3, 4, A, B, C. Right? So this is my string. I call get token using these tokens. Which token is going to be returned? So what is the longest prefix? Shoot, I got up. The longest matching prefix we'll say. L M P R. I don't know, is that spelled there? Anyways, which token is going to be returned? None. None? Why? Because it comes before I num. Does who? So talking about longest, right? Longest, so none matches how many characters here? Starting from the beginning. Four, up to this four. And I num matches how many characters? Right, so they're both long. They're both the longest. And so then we need a tiebreaker, basically. Oh, just reading it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right? And so 
the convention we're going to use in this class is that we are going to break ties by giving preference to the token listed first in the list. Right, so if it comes so higher up on the list of tokens, that's going to be the first token that we choose, if there's ever a tie. Okay. So now we need to go back, hmm, too far back. Now we need to go and try to figure out, okay, you were doing this in your head, right, of tokenizing this 1.1 ABC 1.2, right? But how do we actually do that? What's the algorithm for doing this so that you can do it and the compiler can do it, right? And we need to keep into account this longest matching prefix rule. All right. So let's see if copy paste works. Kind of. All right, let's do something super lame. Okay. These are my tokens. This is my input string. My input string is, what was it? 1.1 ABC. We'll do 1.1 again. The way it looks weird because it's going to parse differently, even though it's like symmetric. Okay, so what were we doing? So try to think through what you were doing. So this is the input string, right? We haven't called get token yet. So we haven't read in any of the input and consumed the input, right? So looking at this first character is, of the input string is one, right? So what, which ones of these tokens match? Num? Decimal, does decimal match? So remember, and this is something I, I think we've been kind of informally using this. When we talk about regular expressions, right, and this is basically part two of your, question two of your homework, right? When I say does one match the regular expression decimal, what I'm saying is is the string <laughs> one, does it exist in the language described by decimal? Does it? No. Is it in the language described by num? Yes. Yes, so that's a match. Right? Okay. What about dot or ID? No? So we've only looked at this character here, right? Let's like keep track. So we've seen, well. So now, if we stopped here, right? If, let's say, there was no more string left, we haven't looked at the next character. We have no idea what's left, right? We're just looking at it essentially <coughs> Is it worth it for me to go there and actually cover it? Uh, no. Is there a way to visually do it, you think? No, you can't see that. Right, so we're considering only this one. We're not considering anything else after it. Right, so just looking at that one, we'd say, well, a match could be a num, right? We don't know what's next, but we know num, and we know its length is one. We've matched a number of length one. Right? And we specifically know what doesn't match. Right? We know ID and dot don't match. But we have another idea of some that have the potential to match. So what's the difference? So a potential match means that we know that there's something else in the string and therefore it could fit into another category if we continue reading input. So we still don't know if there is anything else left yet, but yes, exactly. But uh, what we, we want to think of it as one has matched so far in, let's say, decimal, but it hasn't actually matched yet, but it could continue to match. 
right? So we know definitely decimal, right? We know that that's a potential why. Yeah, because let's say uh, one way you can think of it is that there exists a string in the language described by decimal that starts with one, that has the pre prefix of one. Right? If that's true, then you say, oh, I don't know what's happening afterwards, but I know if there's strings that start with one, then that means that I could potentially match something. So can ID potentially match? Dot? What about number? Why? Yeah, it doesn't, well, does number, we just said number currently matches, right? So the string one is inside the language defined by number. But are there other strings that could be longer than that that start with one? Yeah. Right? And so I'd say, okay, these are potential matches. Then I go and look at the next character. I'm going to try to draw a straight line. Oh, I'll get so good at this. Okay. So now I'm going to consider this next character, which is a dot. Now, do I need to say, does the string one dot match ID? Why not? Yeah, it's not a potential match. We've just decided in that last step what could possibly match. And we said if ID can't match one, if there's no strings in ID that start with one, then there's no possible way one dot is a potential match. Right? So this step actually limited the amount of regular expressions we have to consider in this step. So now we ask the question, well, does one dot A, does it match potential? Does it you mean decimal? Decimal. Does it, sorry, yeah, that's confusing, I use both words. So let's think about match. Does it match potential? Right, one dot, so we have one, we have a dot, but what is, what do all the numbers in decimal have to have after that? A digit. A digit. So it's still potential. Right? But it's still potential, right? Exactly. Okay, what about num? No, so the string one dot is not in the length. It's not, doesn't match, and no strings start with one dot. It's not possible, right? So there's nothing here, and the match didn't change, right? Oh, sorry, um, not didn't change. There's, you can think of nothing. There's nothing here, right? Nothing matches one dot. Because there could be another dot, right? I mean, after this. So maybe we need to go back and say, yes, the longest one I could find was number with length one. Right? But we still have the potential for decimal to match, so we need to do one more check. But we need to keep going. So now we check here, and we're considering the string 1.1, one one, but only considering the regular expression decimal. Right? So is 1.1 one one match decimal? And we're going to say it's length three. Awesome. Oh, how do we know it stops there? Mm. Yeah, because it's also a potential match for decimal. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right? So 1.1 one one is a potential match for decimal. Right? So now we need to keep going. So now I'm going to check the next character. It's going to be 1.1a. One so does that match decimal? 1.1a. One one oh, sorry. It doesn't match anything. Right. It doesn't match decimal. Does it have the potential to match decimal? No. No. So we have an empty set here. We have nothing here. And so should we go on to the next character? Yeah. Why? There's no more potential. Yeah, there's no more potential, right? There's no, nothing could possibly match 1.1ab. One one it actually doesn't matter what the next character is. We already know it's not even possible for that to match. Right? And so then we go and say, okay, which was the longest match that we've seen so far? 
decimal of length 3. And so this is what we're going to return as the longest match that we've seen. So decimal and length 3. And if there was a tie between two regular expressions of the same length, we would choose the one that was higher up on the list. Now I call get token again. What happens to my input string? Yeah. So we did read A off of the input stream. Does it get put back on by some magical convention, or did it get eaten? Because we did technically read A. We read it, exactly. We read four characters, right? We read 1.1A, one one right? And so but we still want that A. Why? Well, because it might be a part of the match for the next token. Definitely, but why do we know we need to put it back? Yeah. But why do we read it again? Why do we know we can safely put that back and not the one before it? Yeah. Because we didn't have a potential match or a match when we examined it. Also, we also didn't, true. We didn't use it. In yes, we did not use it. The token is only length three, right? So how many characters from our input string compose this token? The first three. So now we know we can get rid of those, right? We're saying, by returning decimal and saying that the length is three, we're saying, okay, great, these three are already removed. It doesn't matter how many I had to look forward to determine which one was the longest match. I know that last token I gave you is length three, has three characters, this one, right, 1.1. 1 .1. .1. And so when I call get token again, where's, I'm, where am I going to be reading from? Yeah, I'm going to be reading from this string, A, B, C, 1, dot 1. Right? And I'm going to call get token here. Yeah. So, just to be clear, the lecture is smart enough because the condition that we just went through with A could have happened to an arbitrary number of characters. Yep. We read all of these in, there was still potential, but we decided we didn't want these because the longest match happened to be of a different type. Exactly. So the lexer is capable of storing all of that and putting it back where it's supposed to before we try and parse the next token. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it's not magic, it's pretty easy. I mean, you could think of like stack. I don't know. Yeah, you use a stack, you can just read everything in and then just go backwards. There's always like unseek or unget characters. You could think about doing that if you really are reading from an input string. Um, but yeah, this is how. Yeah, because what if we had, let's say, um, what if we had a token called, I don't know, A, which was, well, whatever. let's call it foo. And it is A star followed by B. <coughs> and then I have bar, which is, let's say, A star or A. And I have the input string, however many A's you want, C. Right? If I go get token on this, how can I differentiate between foo and bar? What was that? Ending with B, exactly. So it's either going to end with B. If it ends with a B, then I know it's a foo. If it doesn't, then I know it's a bar. But I can only know that if I read all of those A's. Right? And then I read this C, and I say, oh, it does not match bar, and it doesn't have the potential to match, uh, sorry, it doesn't match foo, and it doesn't have the potential to match foo, it also doesn't match bar. But this is the longest match that I've seen so far of bar. And so all of those are going to get consumed. You may have to go all the way to the end because you can have things like A star B. So you have to read in a bunch and then go back. But here's the key. Once you make this decision of it's a decimal of length three, you never backtrack and take back that decision. <coughs> so it is a little bit confusing that I said there's no backtracking. Um, there is going back in the input because you may need to read a lot of characters forward. But you never change your decision on what's your decision of the get token is they're always independent, basically. Like the, the lecture has no memory. It doesn't know that it just read a decimal. It just knows now the input is ABC 1.1. 1 .1. 
It's also hands. So we want to re raise them. Yeah. So how does the Lexer identify the potential if it doesn't know the future? So we don't know the future. So how does the Lexer identify whether it's a decimal or number? How do you identify? We know uh, the Lex. Right, based on the regular expression. The Lexer is not matching one right now. The decimal is not matching one right now. So how does the Lexer identify that it's a potential? Uh, the short answer is the Lexa can tell if it doesn't match, like it's already said that it can't match, or that it's still in the process of potentially matching. So you go over more of this in 355 when you talk about regular expressions mapping to DFAs. So you would know based on the DFA that you're still in the DFA, so you still have the potential to match, and you haven't gone to a fail state yet. If you go to a fail state, then you know it's not possible. So now what happens when I call get token on this? So now I'm reading this guy, A. Um, I see it could be an ID. It could be an ID. It has the potential to still be an ID. Wait, can it be an ID? Or should it match first? Does it match ID? Yes. Yes. Does it match dot? No. Does it match num? No. Does it match decimal? No. Does it have the potential to match ID? Does it have the potential to match dot? No. The potential to match num? And the potential to match decimal? So we have ID, and we have here ID of like one. Perfect. And now I'm going to be here considering the string AB. So is AB an ID? Yes. So it is an ID, it matches ID of length two. And does it have the potential to match ID? Yes. yes. Yeah. And we can go again to C. Well, and that edge thing. So does it match? Yes. A, B, C. Does it have the potential to match? Yes. So we do it again. So now we do A, B, C, 1. Does that match an ID? Yes. Right, because we said an identifier is a letter followed by any number of letters, digits, or underscores. Right. Uh, does that have a potential to match an ID? Yes. Yeah, A, B, C, 1. If there's another digit, underscore, letter after it, then it'll work. So we say ID. We'll do it one more time. Here we get to this dot. It does not match ID. Exactly. So we're done here. We say it's an ID of length 4. We return that as a get token. And so what do we have now is the next time we call get token, what's the input string going to be? Dot 1. Dot 1, exactly. And we step through this again and see that it would return dot, and then it would return none. Right? And so if I asked you a question, if I gave you like tokens like this, and then we said, okay, what does get token return? If you keep calling get token until it returns no more tokens, what is the sequence of tokens that it would return? You would say decimal id dot num. And you want to show your work in exactly this form. I have a question. Yes. What would happen if you reach end of uh, like end of file? Uh, you would use your last match. Okay. Yeah. So, but what? I, well, okay. So, what if your last? Well, yeah, I guess your last match wouldn't. Or you can think about returning an error if it doesn't match any tokens, right? It's kind of a similar thing about what do you do if it doesn't match any tokens. Here's a good tip for taking tests. If we haven't really talked about what happens if tokens don't match, and there's no way I say, in case the tokens don't match, return this token, and you're doing the test. And you get to a point where you think, oh no, there's no token that matches, what should you do? Start over. Start over, yes. Yeah. Don't ask me if it's possible for there to be no token, because I just have to say, do your best. So that's what's fair, but based on the questions and context, that should be a sign. Cool. Okay, so.
So this is exactly what we did. So I'm going to briefly walk through this because you, we all just actually figured this out and did this. So this is the way you show your work when doing this uh, lexical analysis here, and right? when doing this get tokens. So why is it important to show your work? We talked about that. On something like this, why is it important? Partial credit. Yeah, well, partial credit, okay. I literally think I exactly said that at the beginning of the class. But why is partial credit so important on this kind of stuff? To find out where we went wrong. Yeah, what happens if you mess up on this first token? Everything else is really captured. Everything else gets completely messed up. And so if you just write down four tokens and the first one's right and the last three are wrong, that's 25%. But if you do that and you show this, then we can take points off here but say, okay, if we assume that we start from this string, which is wrong, but hey, if we start here and the rest of it's correct, you'll get points for all that. Does that make sense? Seems fair? Cool. So the only other slight difference here, when I was doing it by hand, it's a little harder with room, is I do like to keep track of what was the longest match that we've seen so far. And you update that as you go, but besides that, these are the exact same columns, right, that we have used so far. And so just a little, maybe a little more clear here that we're deciding that this is the input, is that idea four, the dot, return that, and number, return number. Question on this? Please. We'll be on your next homework. Okay, so why is this important? Why is lexing important? We've actually reached the end of lexing. This is, this is how you do it. This is it. Bang. Define tokens. Use the lexer. The lexer spits out tokens. Awesome. So, why this is important? Uh, anybody know the Mariner 1 space? I actually don't know if it's a shuttle or a rocket. Unmanned vessel, so yes. So it was actually I don't have the date. Maybe I have it on my notes. Let me check real quick. Click to add notes. No. Okay. So on that example we just had, we had the numbers, decimals, whatever happened to white space. Is white space important in your programming languages? No? But eliminate all the white space in your project one or project two C code and see what happens. Is it going to work the same? Yes. Yes? Yes. White space doesn't matter in C. The compiler doesn't care. I still think there are cases. Keywords followed by each other, maybe? Although, actually, maybe that's not true. I'm guaranteeing you that like, the actual compiler eliminates all white space when it actually flexes. And then put some of the product space in between what you're doing and Yeah, uh, that's where it is. That's what it is. Types. Yeah. Function signatures, right? You have void and function name. How do you know which one's void? Well, maybe with the keyword. Yeah. Could you have a function name that starts with the is done by the preprocessor, by the way. So it's the compiler never sees the includes. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Okay. So most languages, right, if you eliminate all the white space, it would be a problem, right? And in languages like Python, who programs in Python? Some people. White space is actually significant, right? It's how you define indentations. Also, I'll say if you don't use white space when you're doing indentations and braces, you're a monster. <laughs> because you're going to have to read that code someday if you bring it to my office and just Probably a group that's all one line of if statements and all statements, right? That can be a source of errors because you're not indenting, right? It's easier to read. Okay, so the Mariner One was a space, I don't think shuttle, but unmanned space it thing. Was probe. probe? It, it exploded. Have any of you written code that caused something to explode? You have. What was it? What was it? You raise your hand. No. Yeah. No, <laughs> physically explode, not virtually explode. Yeah, cause a physical object to explode. Because mm. That's hardware stuff, though. Have you done that in software, though? Okay, I'd buy that. Okay, most of the times it doesn't. This thing exploded. Why? Well, it's because of lexical analysis. So. 
In most languages, white space is kind of significant, but sometimes not. No, no, no. So here's yes. Yeah, yeah, no. So white space is important in C because between type names, type, the, the variable, the type name, because you can define new types. So type names and variable names. That's only in, well, any type in, in C, you would have to do type that first. Yes, which you can do. That's valid. Anyways, OK, right? These kind of things are important. In Fortran, all white space is ignored completely. And you think, well, maybe that's not the big deal. C does mostly that. What's the difference between these two lines? I mean, this is not like a deep question. What's one difference between these two lines? Literally a one character difference, right? A dot and a comma. Have we all made one character differences before? Did they ever explode a space shuttle? Probably not. So most of the time, when we make a one character error, either the compiler will stop us and tell us what we did wrong, or it will cause some kind of error. Or it'll be, the program will be mostly similar, but something is slightly wrong. In this case, we have two completely different lines of code. The first one set, uh, sorry, the second one sets a variable called do15i equals to 1.100. And the first one does a for loop, for i from 1 to 100, do this thing. So it'd be like changing a for loop to a variable assignment. It's still compiled and ran, and it's what caused the space shuttle to crash. Because of one problem with lexing caused it to parse it as a variable assignment instead of a for loop. Yeah, nuts. Isn't that more of a typing problem? But uh, the type system doesn't even come to effect here, because... You mean typing like the keyboard? Why, why, oh. did, why, why did I get typed to be typed the integer type instead of a decimal type or whatever in that case? Uh, oh, sorry. It's not a, de it's a decimal. Whatever do 15i is. I'm not sure how Fortran type systems work. But the main problem is really that they didn't never want to create a variable. They wanted to do a loop. And if you want to do a loop, but instead initialize a variable, something is wrong. So, there we go.